And Professor Clements with you as uh, we consider some more optics material. Um, teaching out of the OpenStax College Physics textbook, we have a uh, set of slides here, so I'll start at the beginning. But uh, this material in the video today relates to Chapter 25 in OpenStax College Physics, Geometric Optics, talking about rays of light, how light reflects, how it refracts, and a little bit on total internal reflection. So let's go ahead and uh, continue here. So uh, making a, an astronomical telescope, it's important to have a well-polished surface to get uh, good images. It's not a flat mirror, but a little bit of curvature to it that is uh, put there on purpose for focusing purposes. We'll talk about telescopes in a future chapter. Uh, rainbows, uh, sunlight uh, strikes drops of water, there's uh, refraction and reflection going on, and we get uh, dispersion of the colors at different angles to uh, see the rainbow. And I'd ask you, where do you think the sun is in this diagram? There's a pretty big hint, you don't see his sun in the sky. You do see a shadow of the photographer at this location. You'll always, if you're looking at a rainbow, you'll always uh, have the sun at your back. Um, so geometrical optics. In this chapter, we're going to be dealing with uh, objects that light interacts with that are much bigger than the wavelength of the light. And we'll use a little bit of geometry, sine uh, function, and angle considerations uh, in analyzing our problems. So we'll be talking about mirrors, we'll be talking about lenses, uh, the eye, camera, microscope and telescope before we're all done. Not all this is in this chapter, but uh, we'll be investigating those uh, situations. Wave optics will be the situation where we have the light going past smaller objects and there'll be a major change in the way that we analyze uh, how the energy moves past the smaller objects. So starting off with the concept of the ray, these arrows would be rays. We have some source of light at the center here. The light expands out in spheres. Two-dimensionally we draw these circles. That the waves are moving outward. The ray is always perpendicular to the wave front kind of like we drew the electric field and the equipotential surfaces, that the ray is the black arrow. It's perpendicular to the wave front, and the ray shows us the direction the energy is moving. Uh, I could draw more rays here. You could draw fewer rays. just kind of depends on what you need. Uh, and this is uh, in a situation where the wave is spreading out, the arrows are not parallel. If the ray uh, rays are parallel, then we'd be looking at parallel wave fronts and the energy not spreading out. Uh, so the rays give us the direction the energy is moving. Now so here's a situation where one ray is drawn coming into a mirror striking the surface and we have a law of reflection. The law of reflection says that the incident angle, this theta, is equal to the reflected angle, the theta sub r. How do we measure angles? We measure angle between two straight lines. So we draw on a line that's perpendicular to the surface. This is the normal. The normal is always perpendicular to the surface. Where the uh, ray hits the surface, we draw a line 90 degrees away from the surface. That line is called the normal. It's called the normal. And our angle is measured away from the normal. So zero degrees would be something on the normal. And you know, perhaps this is 35 degrees, you know, 55, 60, 70, 80, 90 degrees would be a ray that is just grazing the surface as it uh, is, would be drawn in there. So theta i equals theta r. If we have 35 degrees for the angle of the incident ray, we'll have 35 degrees for the angle of the reflected ray. And we will use degrees here, not uh, radians. If we have a whole bundle of rays, a beam, then uh, we can have this situation if we're reflecting off of a smooth surface, in this case a flat surface, and we could call that specular reflection, where the rays stay organized as they reflect. 
So we have a parallel bundle of rays here. We have a parallel bundle of rays here. In class, we'll show uh, specular reflection from a curved surface. Um, the rays still, in a sense, stay organized, but they won't be parallel when they reflect from a curved surface. So specular reflection, reflecting from a smooth surface, gives us organized rays on the reflected beam. Here's a couple of photographs. It's actually the same photograph. I copied it. And uh, it's Mount Hood, which is near Portland, Oregon. The lake here is called Mirror Lake. So if we don't have wind, the uh, liquid on the surface stays flat, can act like a mirror. And I'd ask you to look carefully at these two diagrams. Which one is flipped upside down? Which one is flipped upside down? And as a clue, I would ask, where do water lilies grow? In water or in the sky? Where do water lilies grow? In water or in the sky? So you can consider that. How about diffuse reflection? Here we have a bundle of rays coming in. They're parallel to each other. They're organized. Each ray locally has to obey the law of reflection. So where a ray hits, we have to draw a normal at that point. If the surface is not flat, not level, then the normals are going to be in different directions depending on the angle of the surface. So in this particular one, we're kind of hitting on a slope. So the normal is going off to at an angle in between these two rays. Here the normal is pretty much straight up and down. Um, here we have a normal about this way. Here's a normal that's angled off this way. A normal off this way. Pretty straight up and down normal. And a normal here. So the local normals have been drawn in, not shown on this diagram, but they are present. The reason the light reflects in different directions is that the normals have different directions compared to one another. And that's illustrated on this slide. Here's another beam of parallel rays coming in. And the slide shows how the normal, the short black line, is drawn for each case. The normal is always perpendicular to the local surface where the ray hits. We draw a perpendicular line. That's the normal. And now we're going to get diffuse reflection. The light scatters off in all directions from this surface. Um, there's kind of an example here that uh, the water is not perfectly smooth. There are waves, so we get the moon beam spreading out uh, wider than uh, just what the moon is. A uh, little example kind of diffuse reflection. Here's a better example. When we shine a flashlight on paper or laser beam on paper, that paper surface is rough at the small level, if you look at the microscope. And as the beams come in, as the rays come in, they hit different uh, angles of roughness. And the normals are going to be in different directions. And three people here could all see the laser light bouncing off of this uh, reflection. And as long as you're not using a laser that's too powerful, it's safe to view laser light that is bounced off of a rough surface. You should not look at laser light that's bounced off of a smooth surface, like a mirror. And here's the mirror case. Uh, the person up here is puzzled. Uh, the light is on, but no light is reaching their eye. All the energy is reflecting in an organized way to the eye that's over here. All the normals are in the same direction where these three rays are hitting. All the normals are parallel to each other. And we have uh, light not bouncing up to uh, the puzzled student's eye. So I'd ask you, if you ever noticed the difference between flat paint and glossy paint, which one is smooth, which one is rough? The flat paint is rough. So as the light comes in, there are many normals for the beam of light as it uh, strikes the surface. Uh, glossy paint is more flat, and the light stays organized. Uh, classrooms are usually built with flat paint so that the room light is more evenly uh, dispersed around the room rather than glossy paint where the, there would be kind of uh, bright spots where the lights reflect off of the glossy uh, wall paint. So you've seen some uh, rays coming in here. Something that is true in these diagrams, uh, it's really unusual for a ray to be perpendicular to the surface or a ray to be parallel. 
we're going to see these diagrams where the rays are at an intermediate angle, not strictly perpendicular, not parallel to our surface, but that's reflection. Angle in equals angle out. So a practical device here, a mirror, person looking in the mirror, maybe you want to conserve money. What's the shortest mirror you can have such that you still see the top of your head and the bottom of your feet? Well, let's put another line on here. I'm trying to draw this level with the person's eye. And again, law of reflection, angle in equals angle out. So there's light from the room that's reflecting off the person's hair, comes to the mirror and comes down here. So if I would draw a line in between here, this would be the normal, and I can't do very well and go too far, but uh, to all the way to the mirror, that would be the normal. And you might suspect that half of the distance from the eye to here, uh, from the top of the head to the eye, sorry, half of that distance is from the eye up to where the normal would hit the head. And same thing looking at the feet. As the person looks at the feet, theta i equals theta r, reflected angle is equal to incident angle. And again, the distance from the person's eye to here is the same as the distance from this point in the diagram down to the person's feet. So the total distance here is the height of the person. You can see that the mirror just uses half of the height of the person. So that's the minimum height for a mirror, where uh, the toes would be visible and the top of the head is visible, half of the height of the person. Now on to refraction, on to refraction. Now instead of the light bouncing off of a surface, we're going to let the light penetrate into water or glass or oil. A lot of substances are transparent, at least partially transparent, and the energy can go through the boundary into the second uh, medium. Um, so perhaps you have one goldfish, and you see multiple goldfish in the tank uh, because of refraction taking place. You see images off to the side where the real goldfish is here uh, straight ahead. Um, here's a beam of light coming into uh, a block of uh, glass. Again, this would be the ray. The normal would be coming off, again, perpendicular to our surface. So our normal would be out here, and there's also normal inside. And you can tell, I think, just looking, that the angle out in the air here is larger than the angle in the glass, especially if I would draw a better normal, that would be the case. Uh, same thing over here. Uh, angle in the glass is smaller than the angle in the air. Again, you have to measure from the normal to the ray in each case. But this is refraction. The light changes direction as it goes to a different type of medium. Um, how many straws are in this glass? Physically, only one. But you can see the straw here, and it looks like the straw is bent. It's not actually bent. Refraction is causing that. And then we're seeing another image of the straw over here. Uh, there's only one straw in this glass, but refraction gives us uh, appearance of a different situation. And here's a little animated uh, GIF file. So let's say we have air out here, and over on the right side we have glass. If you investigate this and kind of look at it closely, you'll find that the speed of the wave is greater out in the air. The speed is slower in the glass. You also should notice that the wavelength has changed. Now we have a greater wavelength here, less wavelength over here. As light travels in air, glass, water, the frequency of the light remains constant. The frequency remains constant. If you remember, speed of light equals wavelength times frequency. The frequency is constant. That means the speed of the light and the wavelength of the light are linked. Where we have a longer wavelength, we have a greater speed. Where we have a shorter wavelength, we have a reduced speed. And that's what's causing refraction. The speed of light changes when it uh, goes from air into glass, or air into water, or air into oil, or water into glass. Um, it changes. So that causes the refraction to take place. Um, if you've ever mowed a lawn and you're mowing on the sidewalk, that's easy to roll the wheels there. When you put the mower into the grass, these wheels are going to have more drag on them 
on the right side before the wheel on the left, and there'll be an automatic turning of the lawnmower in this situation. And same thing is happening here. Lower in in this is the previous slides. Lower speed for the case of the lawnmower in the grass. Higher speed out here, and we get a natural turning of the uh, uh, lawnmower. So this has a relationship called Snell's law that relies on a property of the material called index of refraction. Index of refraction. This index of refraction n. This is not an integer. N is a number. It's going to be bigger than one, but 1.3, 1 1.5, 2.3, you know, various values. Uh, not large numbers, but uh, bigger than one. We calculate index of refraction by taking the speed of light in the vacuum, 3 times 10 to the 8th, divide by the speed of light in the medium. So we divide by the speed of light in glass and uh, divide that into the speed of light in uh, vacuum. We might come up with 1.5. Or we take the speed of light in water, divide it into the speed of light in the vacuum, 1.33. There are various values and there's a table of uh, values of index refraction that we'll be using. It is the case that if we take the index refraction in medium 1, multiply by the sine of the angle of the ray in medium 1, and again the angle is measured from the normal, where this ray hits the interface between say air and glass, uh, we draw this perpendicular line on normal, and now on both sides, there is some reflection that takes place here. We're not going to worry about that um, right now. We're just uh, considering tracing the energy that moves into the, that moves into the glass. So N1, index refraction in medium 1, times the sine of theta 1, the angle of the ray from the normal in medium 1, will be equal to N2, the index of refraction in the second medium, multiplied by the sine of theta 2. And if you are familiar with the sine function or you uh, play with your calculator a little bit, you will notice that the sine function increases, the result of the sine function increases as theta increases. You know, as we go from 0 to 90 degrees with this incoming ray, um, the sine of the angle would increase as theta increases. So let's just take uh, n1 sine theta 1 to be some number. Over here now we have an n2 that is larger than n1. That's the case for this drawing. The index refraction of medium 2 is bigger than the index refraction of medium 1. So we have a bigger number for this factor than for n1. To maintain equality, the sine of theta 2 has to be smaller than the sine of theta 1. And we achieve a smaller value for the sine function when theta 2 is smaller than theta 1. So when we go into a denser optical medium where light travels more slowly, you should always have the ray closer to the normal in angle than what's the case in the region where the speed of light is greater. Uh, the ray turns towards the normal in a higher index of refraction. Then getting into a, another situation where our ray starts in the high index of refraction material. So in this case, here's the glass. Somehow we embed a flashlight in it or laser or something, and we have a ray that's in the glass attempting to get out of the glass. Well, that can happen, and again, uh, the angle is small when the index of refraction is large. Here's the index refraction is small, so the angle is large, out in the air. Air has a smaller index refraction than glass, so our theta 2 has to be bigger than the index, than the angle in glass. However, we can get to a place where the uh, multiplication of uh, n1 times sine of theta 1 is equal to 1.0. n1 times sine of theta 1 equals 1.0. And I'm doing this for the case of air on the top side here. If you would imagine air it has an index refraction of 1, Snell's law would say we'd have 1 times sine of theta 2 here. So what would be the value of theta 2? There's a pretty big hint in the slide here. But doing this for glass and light going into air, N1 sine theta 1, I'm saying that combination on the left uh, picture here for this middle case, 
produces a value of 1. The index refraction times the sine of theta 1 produces 1. That has to equal n2 sine theta 2, but I'm claiming error for our upper medium, so n2 would be a 1, and sine of theta 2 has to equal 1. That occurs at 90 degrees. The bottom illustration here, if we're now bigger than, and this is called the critical angle, when the index refraction times the sine of the angle is equal to 1, um, we have a, a critical angle. If we're, our ray is bigger than the critical angle, 100% of the light reflects. There will be no refraction. We're ignoring impurities and irregularities in the surface here. Uh, but if it's a perfectly smooth surface, then we have 100%. Total internal reflection occurs. All the energy that comes into this boundary reflects off of that boundary. And we'd have the case n1 sine theta 1 is greater than 1. Um, and again, if we have error up here, if I tried to calculate theta 2, this would be, let's say 1.2 is the result of this multiplication. 1.2 equals 1 times sine of theta 2. 1.2 equals index refraction of air, 1.0, times sine of theta 2. If you try to take inverse sine of 1.2, you get an error in your calculator. There is no refraction that occurs. All the energy reflects um, into this uh, bottom medium again. So this can actually be a mirror. Without making a mirror with a silver coating, some reflective coating, if the light comes in at a bigger angle than the critical angle, this acts like a mirror actually better than a mirror. And we can build fiber optics that take advantage of this. If we have light uh, coming down this fiber optics and just grazing the surface, it will hit at an angle that's very large here. This might be 80 degrees. Again, the normal is perpendicular to the surface where the ray hits. So that's going to be bigger than the critical angle. 100% of the, the light uh, is piped through here. So we can have the light go around corners uh, constrained in this optical fiber, this light pipe, and we can use this for communications, you know, the internet. We can use it for medical uh, work. If we have a whole bundle of these optical fibers, it can act like a camera in a sense that can go through blood vessels, it can go uh, down a person's throat into the stomach and the intestine and so forth and a doctor or technician can get a view of the inside of the person's body as long as it's accessible to uh, uh, the optical fiber. Okay, another case here of internal reflection. Why are diamonds so uh, desired for their uh, optical properties? Well, the diamond has a high index of refraction and that turns out to give it a low critical angle, a small critical angle. So experts can cut facets into the diamond and cause a situation where there are many bounces of the light inside the diamond before the light gets out. And that will, uh, there's another effect we're going to study on how uh, the light colors spread out. But this enhances the spreading out of colors and make the diamond sparkle more. Uh, but it's trying to create some internal reflections by making these angled cuts here to uh, give the opportunity for light to bounce around several times inside the diamond before it comes out. Gives a, uh, a striking visual effect. Then our last topic is the corner reflector. So there are two beams of light here. Let's talk about the black one first. So some laser beam perhaps. We shine in here. It hits this right side of this corner reflector. Three mirrors all at right angles to each other, form a corner reflector. It bounces off here, bounces off this side, bounces off this side. And if these are 90 degree angles for these three mirrors, the ray will go back on the same, in the same direction where it came. Or if I have uh, another source of light, this trace through the red, a bounce, a bounce, a bounce. It turns out it comes back in the same direction as to where the light came from. So any applications for this? There's some reason that we'd want an automobile driver to see light reflecting off of something at night. Something that has two wheels, a person riding, pedal power, bicycle reflectors on the spokes of a wheel are short uh, mirrors, lots of them, 
in a plastic package. Uh, the light comes in, the headlight energy is reflected back to the driver. The driver can see the bicycle crossing in front of the car, hopefully at a large enough distance. The car stops, bicyclist uh, goes on, the bicyclist should have been looking for the car coming but uh, didn't perhaps. Um, a little safety system. Another application, I think there are four of these panels of corner reflectors on the moon. Uh, three from the United States, one from the Soviet Union placed there and regularly there's a laser that uh, from an observatory in New Mexico that shines at this spot on the moon. The laser light hits here and the laser light is very weak when it gets back to the earth but a telescope can sense the return of that laser light and uh, from again distance equals rate times time the distance to the moon can be calculated based on the round trip time of this laser light but without this corner reflector, uh, the moon rocks would not reflect enough energy to, uh, to get a measurable signal here. So corner reflectors on the moon enable astronomers to keep track of the distance to the moon. And you could read more about that. There's quite a bit of interesting material about the change in the moon's orbit. That's where we end. hope you uh, read through the reading guide and uh, start practicing some problems.